Welcome friends to this uh, fifth lecture of week 9 of soil science and technology and in this lecture uh, we will be finishing this uh, wind erosion and we will be talking about different control measures of wind erosion and then we will be talking about different organic pollutants which are present in the soil. And uh, so, in the last lecture we talked about different what is wind erosion and how uh, we can calculate the wind erosion, what are the different factors of wind erosion. Now, we will discuss about different control measures of wind erosion. So, uh, there are uh, you know several aspects we need to take care of while measuring the wind erosion, uh, while controlling the wind erosion. So, soil moisture obviously, the soil moisture increases the cohesiveness and the wind speed requires to detach the soil particles uh, you know increases dramatically as soil moisture increases. Obviously, when there is a soil moisture it increases the cohesiveness between the particles. So, we require mar much more higher uh, you know wind speed. So, the we do to detach the soil particles. Soil cover uh, you know plant cover effectively protects the soil from blowing especially if the plant roots are well established. So, crop rotation that includes crop cover can greatly diminish the wind erosion. Plant roots are you know are having much important effect for controlling the wind erosion because they can attach the soil particles, they can anchor the soil particles more uh, strongly and uh, tillage is the effect of the tillage depends not only on the type of the implement used, but also on the timing of the tillage operation. For example, tillage can greatly reduce the wind erosion if it is done uh, while there is a sufficient soil water to cause the large uh, you know to cause the large clots to form. So, when there is a large clot obviously, there is a less chance of wind erosion because there will be requiring high amount of uh, high wind speed to detach the soil particles or to move the soil particles when they are forming the clots. And finally, barriers, barriers of wind breaks such as the shelter belts will be will be will be talking about the shelter belts are effective in reducing wind velocities for short distances and for trapping the trapping drifting soil. So, significant protection against the wind erosion and uh, extends to a distance of about uh, 10 times the height of the barriers. So, we will be seeing that. So, all these five you know four uh, aspects need to be considered while we are um, thinking about any designing any method uh, designing any as uh, you know any management strategy for controlling the wind erosion. Um, so, you can see this uh, this is an example of wind erosion control in uh, in a China. So, ecological engineers they can use the checkerboards straw checkerboards. So, this is a new technology where they are using the straw in the form of checkerboards and most of the you know some portion of these checkerboards are buried into the soil and some portion are uh, exposed over the soil surface. And uh, as a result of these checkerboards, these helps in uh, actually these checkerboards are used for uh, erosion control and stabilizing the sand dunes and all this. And if, uh, so, uh, also reforestation and you know and for growing the crops. So, these are some of the ways they have con used for controlling the wind erosion in this uh, uh, you know arid Nixia province in China. So, it is a fairly new technology that they are using. So, uh, also there is a the, the most important uh, uh, you know way of uh, you know controlling the wind erosion is the called the shelter belts. So, it is basically rows of fast growing trees around crop plants that can provide wind breaks reducing erosion by the uh, by wind. So, we generally we plant the rows of fast growing trees along around the crops. So, you can see these are the fast growing trees around the crops. So, that wind is getting obstacle you know wind is facing obstacle while um, going while flowing through this crop field and uh, thereby reducing the uh, wind erosion. So, this is the this shelter belts is you know is the most effective way for controlling the wind erosion from crop field and uh, tillage erosion. So, tillage erosion because uh, you know there are several tillage implements such as chisel plow uh, loosen and move large quantity of soil some of which is thrown into the air. I talked about this uh, during our discussion of uh, uh, vertical or turbo tilling practice 
in conserve in uh, conservation agriculture and the amount of and as a result of this you know the the soil large quantities of uh, soil which has been thrown away by this tillage implements and uh, the amount of a certain soil particles will be moved and distance and you know and the distance it is moved will depends on the design of the implement depth of the tillage and speed of the travel the soil moves mainly in the direction of the travel but will move much further when the travel is uh, down sloped to uh, so gravity assists the movement when tillage and, and then just opposite condition when the tillage is up slope gravity hinders the forward movement of the soil so you can see here chisel plow in action and this is the direction of travel obviously as a result of that these huge amount of you know soil particles which are getting detached and you know uh, thrown away they will move along with the wind and they will deposit to other places obviously this movement will be uh, much further when the travel is down slope so gravity also helps in the uh, movement so you can see here uh, uh, this is a pre-tillage landscape uh, you know it is a pre-tillage landscape this is a post-tillage landscape obviously uh, you know th this is a whitish calcareous subsoil material from the molly soil is mixed into the plow layer of a conventionally tilled field in a subhuman region. So, this diagram basically illustrates how tillage scalps the hilltops by throwing the soil further down the uh, down, uh, down slope than up slope. So, you can see here this is the the wind erosion. So, soil basically from this uh, portion thrown by this wind and tillage got further down the slope than up slope and uh, gravity further helps in the movement of the soil particles down the slope here and ultimately these particles will be deposited down the slope resulting in the net movement of soil down slope and graduate leveling of the landscape. So, you can see ultimately gradually it is being leveled and ultimately exposing the whitish calcareous subsoil material from the mali soil. So, you can see these pictures also. So, ultimately as a result of wind movement the top soil is getting moved downwards and helping and which is further assisted by the gravitational movement and ultimately uh, you know, exposing the subsoil and ultimately leveling the ground. So, quantification of the tillage, ero tillage based erosion there are several models of tillage erosion that are based on the relationship between the amount of soil moved by tillage in the up slope and down slope direction of slope gradient. The most general of these models is tillage erosion risk indicator model we you know and the short form is this till ERI and which is the simplest form considers the product of a tillage implement factor and a landscape factor. So, uh, this equation is basically A t equal to E t multiplied by E l where A t is the annual rate of soil movement down slope due to tillage operation it is megagram per hectare per year and E t is basically the erosivity of tillage operations which is expressed as kg of soil move annually per meter of tillage width and percentage slope inclination where uh, you know a slope of 45 degrees considered as 100 percent and E L is basically the irritability of the land slit, uh, of the landscape. So, how quantification of the tillage erosion. So, the la landscape irritability factor or uh, this E L is based on slope length or small l and the slope gradient that is S factor values and can be determined using the topographic data from the revised universal soilless equation. Uh, RUSLE, we have already discussed about this revised universal soilless equation and the soil properties such as water content, texture and structure also influences the vulnerability of the landscape to tillage erosion. We have covered all these things in our previous lecture, so I am not going to discuss this in further details. And remember that the erosivity of the tillage operation ET is a function of four factors. These four factors are basically ID, IO, IM and I B and all these four factors are related to tillage implement how it is used. So, let us see what are these factors. So, these factors this I D represents the design of the tillage implement that is the type size number and angle of the coulters, tines and other steel parts that interact with the soil. 
the second factor io represents the mode of operation of the implement namely the speed and depth of tillage and the third factor im represents the match between the available power of the tractor and the power required to draw the implement and finally the fourth factor ib represents the operator behavior that is how steadily and how uh, and, and in what patterns across or up or down the slope the farmer drives across the field so this tillage erosion is also an interplay between these individual factors and all these factors are taken into account while we are collecting the tillage phase erosion so guys please uh, you know uh, i'm just giving an overview of this uh, erosion erosion you know cultivation there are several models available in uh, uh, in the web, in the internet and you can uh, make a google search uh, to learn in details about these models and uh, i hope that you have uh, learned uh, several things in this lecture or in this topic and let us uh, wrap up this uh, uh, let us wrap up this uh, wind erosion and tillage erosion and move to our uh, final topic of uh, this week that is toxic organic chemicals in soil and uh, so well, talking about the toxic organic chemicals in the soil uh, there are several ways through which these toxic organic chemicals uh, can be present into the soil obviously these uh, you know uh, the, the several ways like accidental leakage then spills then uh, through plant burials and spraying and other treatments now you can see here uh, there is an accidental spill of uh, crude oil or petroleum in an area in israel so that is the way through which this organic chemicals uh, pres you know organic chemicals uh, you know are uh, spilled or uh, you know present in the soil environment so let us also discuss about the environmental damage from different organic chemicals for discussing the environmental damage from organic chemicals we first have to uh, you know discuss about the xenobiotics remember this is a very very important term and xenobiotics are basically synthetic organic chemicals which are unfamiliar to the living world and it basically comes from the Z greek word xeno that means strange so being non natural many xenobiotics are either toxic to living organisms or resistant to biological decay or both so these xenobiotics i mean uh, all these organic chemicals which are present into the soil organic pollutants are which are present into the soil they can uh, they can pose a serious threats not only to the existing you know the soil microorganisms or macroorganisms but also it poses serious threats to the ecosystem to the crops as well as to the plant to the human health so these xenobiotics again these are synthetic organic chemicals which are unfamiliar to the living world and they are coming uh, from this greek word xeno that means strange so being non natural many xenobiotics are either toxic or to living organisms or resistant to biological decay or both and the chemical structure of the xenobiotic compounds may be quite similar to those of naturally occurring products by microorganisms uh, and plant and the difference there is obviously a difference the difference is commonly the insertion of halogen atoms so in the xenobiotics you will see there is an insertion of these halogen atoms like chlorine fluorine bromine or multivalent non metal atoms such as sulfur and nitrogen into the structure so again the xenobiotic structure uh, may be quite similar to those naturally occurring compounds however you will see the uh, the predominance of chlorine fluorine and bromine as well as multivalent non metal atoms sulfur and nitrogen in the structure of the xenobiotics so let us see the uh, representative compounds in 18 classes of widespread organic contaminants which are present into the soil uh, let us start with the xenobiotics um, uh, obviously the industrial xenobiotics you can see uh, a pcb or uh, polychlorinated biphenyls uh, this is uh, you know dichlorobiphenyl and obviously this is a trichloroethylene uh, and this is mtb that means methyl tertiary butyl ether and this pah that is polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon which is uh, with this polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon is present when there is a petroleum spill and uh, tnt or 246 trinitrotoluene 
it is an explosive and also uh, PCP that is pentachlorophenol. So, all these are industrial xenobiotics and these industrial xenobiotics creates a huge amount of uh, you know in the, you know environmental effects especially these PAH they are uh, you know they are the cause of uh, different types of carcinogenic effects and uh, we must be very very careful when there is a uh, you know when there is an uh, oil spill and also these other uh, industrial xenobiotics are also very very environmentally harmful. So, let us see the insecticides, uh, you know insecticides are the major organic pollutants which are present into the soil and uh, let us start with the DDT which is chlorinated hydrocarbons, you can see in the structure as I have told you the chlorines are present and uh, you know the chlorines are present. Uh, so, it is a chlorinated hydrocarbons, then carbarils, carbarils are you know carbamates uh, and uh, you know parathion which are basically organophosphate group of uh, insecticide. So, you can see here sulfur is present as I have told you and uh, so this is very very important. So, sulfur is present in the parathion or in the organophosphate and also phosphorus is present here and uh, chloranthiandine which uh, basically uh, represent this new nicotinoids uh, which is also an important uh, pesticide. You can see this uh, chlorine is present, sulfur is present, nitrogen is present. So, multivalent uh, non-metal cations, uh, non-metal ions are present and uh, also the uh, you know uh, this chlorine is present in the uh, new nicotinoids. So, creating uh, you know environmental hazards. So, these are all insecticides. Let us talk about the herbicides which are gaining very, very important nowadays because the consumption of herbicides is increasing day by day. Uh, important herbicides you can see here alachlor which are coming from the acetam, uh, acetanilide groups and then EPTC which are representing the uh, carbamoethiotes and then 2,4-D uh, which is basically uh, phenoxy alkanoic acids and then trifluralin which is uh, dinitroanilines and then linurons which is basically substituted urease and you can see uh, nicosulfurons which are basically sulfonyl ureas and uh, this is acetochlor and then glyphosate and atrazines which are representing triazines. So, you can see all these are herbicides and you can see all these which I have discussed starting from xenobiotics and then insecticides and these herbicides, these represent 18 classes of widespread organic contaminants which are present in the uh, soil environment and thereby you know thereby cre creating different health related hazard as well as environmental hazards in the, uh, in the soil ecosystem. So, uh, if you see the pesticide consumption trend in India, uh, uh, this pesticide consumption trend in India, you can see here in 1000 tons, there is a continuous increase in pesticide consumption up to 2016 and 17 and uh, you know, you know 15, 14, 15 and 16 and 17. And, uh, um, obviously, uh, the uh, so this green bar basically shows the total consumption and consumption per hectare also increases. So, there is a continuous increase in consumption per hectare obviously for last 2 years there is almost uh, virtually stagnation. However, uh, you can see in the you know ultimately they have increased from the starting that is at the st uh, you know at, in 2000 and 2001 obviously the consumption was uh, fairly less. And if you see the state wide consumption of uh, you know pesticide, if you see the total consumption is higher in certain states like you know um, in Punjab it is very very high, in Maharashtra it is also high uh, you know and in Uttar Pradesh it is also high. So, all these states like Punjab, Maharashtra, Uttar Pradesh all these are showing high pesticide consumption as compared to you know and per kg uh, uh, per, per hectare utilization of per hectare consumption of pesticide is also increase in you know, high in case of uh, you know Punjab and Haryana 
and as well as uh, you know other states like maharashtra and uh, you know uh, and so on and so forth like kerala and uh, uttar pradesh and if you see the compose i mean the uh, comp, you know the you know the use of different types of pesticides obviously the pesticides are insecticides can be differentiated into insecticide fungicide herbicide and rodenticide and if you change the change in change in use of different types of pesticides along uh, over the time you can see the while the use of insecticides is getting reduced the use of fungicide and also the use of herbicides and also the use of rodenticide are getting continuously increased along the time so uh, you can see that the pesticide consumption trends in india are showing the increasing pattern some states are showing high uh, consumption of the pesticides and that is why you know it is very very detrimental for those ecosystem especially i would i would talk about the punjab where the per hectare uh, consumption of the pesticide in 2016 17 you can see it is highest and as a result of that there is always uh, more incidence of human health hazards like cancers and other uh, effects so this shows the effect of uh, persist uh, you know of this uh, pesticides in indian condition and uh, so what are the problems coming from the pesticides obviously there are several uh, aspects uh, several problems first of all public health impacts we'll discuss that and then domestic animals death and contaminations is another effect the loss of natural enemies when we are continuously increasing the pesticide or insecticide there is a you know uh, you know there is a inherent you know uh, somewhat resistance uh, is being grown within the within the within the pests and also some loss of natural enemies pesticide resistance i have talked about it honey bee and pollination losses we are seeing that because of this pesticide based poisoning crop losses increase of uh, increase of pesticide consumption sometimes damage the crops fishery losses because this pesticide will ultimately move away through the runoff and ultimately deposit into the different water bodies creating uh, you know toxic condition bird losses and also ground water contamination so these are the different problems which are arising from pesticide uh, contamination in uh, soil then another important term is pop or persistent organic pollutants uh, we also you know these are also uh, uh, coming from the organochlorines as you can see ddt uh, hexachlorobenzenes and tcd uh and then 24d 245t uh, 24d 245t are uh, basically uh, the herbicides whereas ddt acv are insecticides so these are basically you can see these are organochlorines because most all of them are having chlorine in their structure and uh, you know why they are called persistent organic pollutants because they stay in the environment for a long period of time and travel long distance okay so polychlorinated biphenyls or pcbs are common pesticides such as ddts or dioxins are these organic uh, persistent organic pollutants so if you see the important process which are affecting the dissipation of organic chemicals or uh, you know both xenobiotics and these uh, pesticides in the soils you can see there are several processes so it can either goes to the atmosphere Uh, due to the volatilization process or it can be adsorbed these organic chemicals can be adsorbed uh, in the organic matter or clay uh, in the soil or it can leach down to at the in the water table due to you know in the soluble in the in the solution form or uh, you know it can uh, it can decomp de it can chemically decompose by several microorganisms which are present in the soil or uh, you know it can you know different types of two different types of reaction chemical decomposition some biological aerobic degradation occurs due to the microorganism effect at the surface soil layers where there is an uh, where there is a relatively high aeration as compared to subsoil layers and then anaerobic biological degradation occurs in anoxic condition or subsoil layers and then uh, you can see here uh, there is some 
runoff based losses of these organic chemicals and deposition to other places and finally absorption exudation by different uh, you know uh, by crops and ultimately by you know different human uh, you know human body so these are several ways through which these organic chemicals uh, dissipate into the environment and uh, you know there are different fates of these organic chemicals and uh, let us see uh, you know why different pesticide adsorption pattern in the soil obviously this showing the adsorption relation between amount of adsorb adsorbent and adsorption percentage for a particular type of soil so you can see adsorption of polychlorinated biphenyl uh, by different soil materials here so it basically shows the trend of absorption of polychlorinated biphenyl which is an important uh, uh, pop by different soil materials so you can see the soil lost much of its adsorption capacity when treated with hydrogen peroxide because they are basically removing all the organic carbon which is present into the soil by oxidation the amount of soil material which is required to absorb 50 percent of the pcb was approximately 10 times as great for montmorillonite obviously you can see this is a montmorillonite as for soil organic matter so you can soil or this is a soil organic matter curve and this is a montmorillonite based curve so you can see the amount of soil material required to absorb the 50 percent of the PCBs were approximately 10 times higher. So, this is an amount of absorbent soil materials and when we are using the uh, H2O2 treated soil obviously the amount of uh, soil material needed uh, to uh, absorb this uh, 50 percent of the PCB is uh, also uh, increasing 10 times or more. Okay. So, you can see here as the, the basically this trend shows that as there is a continuous decrease of organic matter obviously there will be less amount of adsorption of this pesticide in the soil. So, that is why there is always need for maintaining a good amount of organic matter into the soil to detain more pesticide into the soil and restrict their movement to other places not only ok. So, what is the effects of pesticide in soil microorganisms obviously, uh, the first effect is mortality when we are applying this pesticide that will kill the native microorganism. Apart from organic you know mortality these effects of organic pesticides are also very subtle. Uh, for example, you can see here uh, you know the burrowing behavior of the earthworm are shown to be dramatically inhibited by a neonicotinoid insecticide here uh, then is neonicotinoid insecticide is imidacloprid. So, when you are increasing, so this is a control condition, this is an uh, you know 0 0.1 mg per kg concentration where is 0 0.5 mg per kg. So, burrowing cap activity behavior of earthworm, earthworm is also reduced because their activity is reduced while we are increasing the different uh, you know uh, pesticide concentration in the field. So, that shows the deleterious effects of increasing amount of pesticide effects. Obviously, pesticides are need for controlling the weeds and controlling the paste, but also they are having this type of advert, you know desire, you know deleterious effect. And finally, the human health effect is very, very important and you can see parts of the body absorb pesticide at different rates and the head is four times more uh, you know absorbent than that a hand and the genital area is 11 times more uh, you know absorbent. So, depending on the different parts uh, different types of symptoms of pesticide ingest, ingestion is there and as a result obviously due to the high amount of pesticide ingestion and high accumulation of pesticide in the different parts of the body there are several types of uh, non curable diseases like cancer and other things are happening nowadays specifically in Punjab areas of uh, India. So, that is that is why we need to be very very careful while handling this uh, persistent organic pollutants and organic pollutants into the field in the in the in the agricultural areas and I hope that you have learned something in this uh, lecture. So, uh, we are now finishing the week 9 lectures all the 5 lectures and we will be starting uh, the week 10 of lectures from you from the next lecture and uh, we will be covering different ways to uh, control this uh, organic pollution as well as we will be discussing different types of inorganic pollutants in the soil. So, thank you guys let us meet in week 10 uh, lectures bye bye.